today on the podcast we have Murray Tim. He's got a ridiculous number of NASCAR Cup Series championships and race wins, all while working for Hendrick Motorsports over the last 26 years. To be exact, he's been there for the last 13 NASCAR Cup Series championships and 231 Cup Series race wins. He's built cars for the likes of Dale Earnhardt Jr., Kyle Busch, and Chase Elliott. He's got a huge amount of time spent in the wind tunnel, and he was, in the early 2000s, the front tire changer for Terry Labonte. Murray has received the prestigious Papa Joe Hendrick Award of Excellence, voted on by all 600 employees of Hendrick Motorsports and only given to one each year. He's a passionate racer, and he's a true professional. Enjoy. I know, uh, so Dale Jr. used to... Um used to work for us obviously yeah right, right he was a really quiet guy um i don't know i'm not i'm not gonna say he was a snob but he was kind of you know just not very talkative and sure. kind of kept to himself and people that worked there and then once he got married and had kids whole new guy really started his podcast totally different guy now yeah i mean that's it, it just it happens right you end up you have more conversations with some um you know intention and you get better at it. Yeah, he's like a super good speaker now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he that was always the way, like watching, and he was never really good in front of the camera or anything. And No, even in the shop when he came in, he was kind of like, he would pick his five guys he would go talk to, right. and he wouldn't talk to anybody else. Do you think it was just kind of his position, just being, you know, growing up kind of probably being a little bit shy and not really, you know, you know what I mean? Just a very unique position. M maturity. Yeah. I think he just like he's so much more mature. Like when he worked for us, they he they partied all the time. Okay. I mean, he took his job serious, right? Like racing, but um, but once he started the podcast, he just uh, he just looks like the, the way he speaks, and you can tell he's just a lot more mature. You can talk his wife and having kids and stuff. He's just grown up a lot. It's kind of cool. It's cool to see. Yeah. Well, I, I've got a two month old, so having kids will make you mature overnight. So you're gonna mature more. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, gave me the mustache. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for driving all this way just for this podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that's good. It's exciting. Yeah. Anyone who's a racer, I'm always curious as to, you know, their family history in racing and, and what was their first exposure to racing or motorsports or whatever it was. What made you bite the hook? Yeah. So, uh... At 16, um, well, my dad had worked in an engine shop his whole life and uh, adult life. Um, he went into business with four other guys, had a, a shop in Kitchener called Four Way Automotive. Um, and then the partners kind of split up. They all went different directions. And my dad wanted to continue in the business. So he started a new business in Waterloo called uh, New Trend and had seven or eight employees, had a full engine shop, full parts department, um, and managed to work all through Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph area. And uh, I started going there at nights after school, weekends and stuff, working, cleaning machines. Um, he taught me how to, you know, machine parts and stuff like that, and then got into build motors. And uh, when I was uh, 15 or 16, uh, one of his customers uh, that he was building a motor for asked me if I ever wanted to come to the racetrack and help him. So I went to his house during the week. And right then I was like, this is me. I, I love this. And uh, he was just working. On, what, what did he have? He had a hobby car. OK. Yeah. Yeah, in a single car garage yeah. uh, at his house. So I went over there and we started just meddling with it. And I went to the track with him a couple of times. And the, the, the hobby club toured a lot. Right. So they went to Michigan. So I went to Michigan with them. And the more I was around them, the more people I met. And it's, in, you know, it's addicting uh, just meeting the people and the racing side of it. And I really liked it. So when I was. Uh, this, this, I watched some of your some of your shows and that and oh good the Mark Dilly one like that's me okay yeah yeah, yeah. came out of the same cookie cutter yeah. so I quit school in the tenth grade halfway through the tenth grade um, just so I could go work full time for my dad and uh, I loved working for my dad it was great he had he had some really good employees but they taught me so much about building motors and machining parts and um, so I quit school and and I kind of did the racing side of it and what what how did your dad feel about that was he was he thrilled was he you know just well it's your own decision How, did he want you to finish school he no he he didn't really care he the only thing he cared about he said you have to come to work every day right 
and uh, he said, you're not going to goof off, you know. So I quit school. I borrowed some money from one of my uncles. I bought a, I bought a hobby car, and I worked all day at my dad's five days a week. Okay. And uh, so I still started building hobby motors, late model motors and stuff. And race motors are hard to make money on. Mm. So my dad kind of backed away from some of the racing stuff and kind of let me have it. Okay. So I would come in. I, I was kind of a crappy employee. I'd, I'd come in at like 9 o'clock in the morning where they'd start at 7. But then I'd work till 9 o'clock at night. And they were all gone. But I really enjoyed the racing side of it, building motors and stuff, and uh, met a lot of you know, our customers. Um, and I didn't do it all by myself, obviously. My dad did a lot of machining, but I assembled all the race motors. And um, I really liked it. We had met a lot of people. And, and of course, I was racing at the same time. So how, you, uh, you had helped this guy with his hobby car, and you said, okay, I assumed you started racing hobby cars? I did, okay. yeah. Yep. And you're like, okay, that's the way to go. Yeah, so I so because he was in the hobby club, I met a lot, a lot of their guys, and it was an economical class to be in at right. the time, right? Compared to late models, which obviously everybody would would like to go there, but um, I had to just kind of go up the ladder. So I started in a hobby car, and uh, in that class, you can I'm a creative person, right? So I kind of like you can build a lot of the parts. Almost you can pretty much build the whole entire car by yourself, right? If you can figure out how to you know make all the parts. So uh, it was fun. Um, I built my own car. I don't know how many, I probably built five or six, um, and uh, you can just be creative and doesn't not, not spend a lot of money. Of course, I could build our own motors, so I could I could do it really cheap, right, just mm -hmm. because I could do it all by myself in our shop. And then I got to a point where um, our motors were really fast, and like I said, I didn't do it by myself. My dad taught me a lot, and he, he had all these cool ideas, so we had, like, some stupid power. Okay. <laughs> and then we couldn't keep them in our car because everybody wanted to buy them, right, because we built motors for our customers, and we are racing our customers, and, of course, I had the best motor all the time. So. Right. They would buy my motor, so I have to build another one. So every couple of weeks, I'd have to build another motor, and uh, so it was kind of cool. It was fun. It probably worked out for business. It helped him. Yeah, yeah, he loved it. It was cool. But it, like all of our customers are awesome, great people. My dad loved it too. He was eating it up. Right. It was a lot of fun. So that's kind of how I got started in racing. And were you, you know, super competitive? Were you pretty quick right away? How did you like? You, you were certainly hooked, but was there aspirations to? you know, climb the ladder or whatever that ladder looked like in your mind? Yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> when I started, uh, I just, it was, it was the learning curve, right? Just like everybody has to go through. Um, but no, as soon as you start, it's addicting. And uh, of course I wanted to win. It took me a few years and then, then we started winning races and it was a lot of fun. So. Okay. Now jump to, or, or fill in the blank for me, m moving down to North Carolina how did that happen and who did you go with okay some more funny stories and it was it, it, it took years and i didn't that wasn't my goal like i didn't really i didn't have a plan in life where i was going to go with it um i just raced and uh my uh so i'm i married i married uh wendy connington from guelph ontario i met her she was actually in the grandstand um and her and her girlfriends would bet how many times i would spin out in a race oh no <laughs> eventually uh i met her um at a racetrack and then and she's uh got two other sisters and they're married racers so once once you realize how big the racing family is it's huge right everybody knows everybody so mm -hmm. it was kind of cool um marty's or sorry let me back up wendy's um middle sister nancy married marty gaunt okay marty gaunt um at the time worked for canadian tire in barry and uh me and marty were friends just through the family and through racing and we decided to take a trip to Charlotte to go watch uh, the Coca-Cola 600. And when we got down there, uh, we met Peter Gibbons. He was staying at the same hotel that we were staying at. He was Canadian, so, you know, we all had a lot in common. And he needed some help. And he said, hey, if, you know, if you guys aren't doing anything, I'll get you guys passes and you guys can come and help me. So we said, okay. And what was he running? He was running uh, the NASCAR Sportsman Series, which is kind of old, retired, cup cars right. um they created that class and it ended up dissolving just because a lot of guys got hurt it was it was kind of the cars are really fast but not really safe you know right. so so we went and helped him that weekend well we didn't know what his um racing program was like so when he said he was going to get us passes we went to like the local grocery store and went down the soda aisle and he found he had his his pass for the weekend and, and matched it up with the colors on the boxes and we like made our own passes because oh he, he didn't want to buy them right yeah. so yeah so he gave he we're sitting there making passes <laughs> gluing them together in the hotel room so we could get in and then uh one of us had to hide in the trunk of his car yeah. and uh so that was once we got that uh in our blood like that how big the sport is down there mm. 
then we were addicted to that, right? That was the next step. We needed we needed to get back here. So we went, we came home, and uh, one guy that I grew up with helped me in racing for a long time. His name is Tony Cuesta. He lived down the street from me, but um, we're like, hey, we need we need to go make this trip. We need to go we need to go down south. I want to get a job. And he's like, you're crazy. So we went. About a week later, we went back, and we were in Charlotte. Watched uh, watched another race. We went a bunch of shops. And the All-American 400 was going to run that weekend, too. So we went over to Nashville and watched the All-American 400 and then went home. And then it got quiet. We didn't really – I didn't really have a plan. I, I didn't really get a job. I didn't talk to anybody that had gave me any hope, right? So we just came home. But you were keen, like, I want to go – I had the itch. Be a part of racing. I be. After I saw what was going on down there, that is a whole different life, right? It's, it's 100% racing. Like, up here, racing – people that race – take it really serious but it's on a really small level right yeah. um where down there people do it every day i don't i don't want to go to a shop and work five days a week and a race on a weekend i want to do it every single day so uh we came home and we got a phone call from peter gibbons he said i'm gonna run some more races if you guys want to help me so me and marty said yeah for sure we so we signed up and started driving to stovall ontario um on weekends and then peter um hired us basically full-time so um so so he his shop was in stoville correct yeah okay and and he, what was he running out of that shop cast car eventually so okay. at the time uh, he had some he had two or three of the the nascar sportsman cars then he bought an arc car okay eventually getting a couple more arc cars um and then got turned on to the cast car program also at, out of the same shop so we had a lot of stuff going on right. and decided to build a shop in morrisville north carolina at the same time Okay. So once I started working for Peter full time, we would go down to Charlotte or Mooresville um, for a week at a time, sometimes a month at a time, and we'd help build the shop. So he had paid a company to put the steel building up, but then he wanted to build an engine room, um, some apartments upstairs, offices, all that stuff. So there was a few of us that stayed down there all the time, and uh, basically it took us a year to build it. We lived in a motorhome in the parking lot and then uh, built the shop. How old were you at this time? I was probably 24 when I started helping Peter, yeah. And that was the dream? It was cool. It was a little rocky. Yeah. But uh, I tell a lot of people, the path that I, it took me to get where I got to, it, I wouldn't change it. Mm. Because you, I think you learn so much more if you do it the hard way rather than somebody give it to you, right? So, yeah. so I, I'm glad that I took the path that I took and learned a ton of stuff on the way, right? So... Uh, so I worked for Peter for a couple of years, and uh, he moved. Did he move full time down to Mooresville, as far as the shop goes? At that point, no. Okay. We were still back and forth a lot. Um, he still he started doing the the cast car program, so he he'd have to come back here and race cast cars, and we we'd go back up to Stillville and work on the cars, and then we'd have an Arca race come up, so we'd have to come back to the south and work on the Arca cars. So we were kind of back and forth quite a bit, and uh, he had picked up NTM bearings for a sponsor, which was a big deal, for, you know. Um, financially helped him do a lot of racing and we heard through the grapevine that they might be going away mm. and marty and i were uh wanted we still wanted to go bigger right we wanted to go cup racing so marty <laughs> marty said to me dude we need to we need to find we need to find out how to get out of here because i don't know how long this is going to last right so we're like all right what should we do and marty's like let's let's just go get a job i'm like well how you can't just go get a job so we started interviewing. We started doing the same thing, going around shop to shop. Yeah. And, I mean, most guys will know, but for people who don't know, that's where every race shop is, is within, what, a 20-kilometer radius. Yeah, I'd say 95% of the shops are all there. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of – some of the big tracks are close by. A lot of short tracks are there. Um, parts are everywhere um, where if you get away from that Charlotte area where all the teams are, it's harder to get parts. Um, you know, they're right next door if you need to get something so you can do it really fast. Um, I had some friends that lived in, uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and he, he used to just joke with me where he, if he needed a pop rivet, it took him a week to get a pop rivet, right? Cause right. it's not accessible. <laughs> so, so, uh, Marty and I started going around shop to shop and, uh, Marty called Andy Graves. He was a tire guy at Hendrick and told him about me. And he said, you know, he's a fabricator. He can do a lot of stuff. And, um, Andy told him to send me over so I, I can went over there and interviewed with a guy named eddie dickerson and uh they that was in the body hanging department 
at Hendrick, and I like doing a lot of sheet metal stuff. I, when I built my own cars, that was kind of my niche to to do all the sheet metal stuff on them. I kind of got out of the engine building part. Um, and where did you pick up those fab skills with Gibbons? Um, just when I was building my own cars, yeah. I would I would build a car, and then you just learn ideas, and I'm like, I wonder if I could apply this to like a, a real car down south, you know? Um, and obviously they were they were ahead of me, but I just thought I was pretty smart at the time. <laughs> But uh, so uh, let's fast forward to you got the interview with yep, the, the team. Yeah, with Andy Graves moved moved me over to uh, got switched me on to Eddie Dickerson. Eddie Dickerson ran the body hanging department, and he said, if "Whenever uh, if you don't find anything, come back in a week." So so I went back in a week, and he said, ah, "I don't really have anything yet, but um, I'll keep your number." It's like I th- okay. So Marty and I said, let's go to, we'll go to Richmond and watch a cup race. So we got pit passes and I was walking around. I seen Eddie Dickerson and he said, Hey, are you going to come and work for me or what? And I was kind of like, at the time he wasn't really going to hire anybody, you know? So he said, uh, come next week, you can start. So I was like, perfect. Well, so I did this. I did that. I went down, started there, uh, October 1st, 1996. Marty hadn't found a job yet. So he was he was at Gibbons still. So he had he had made this introduction for you. He had the connection. Okay. So Marty was kind of a manager type position for Peter, right. and Peter and I built the cars and built the motors. Um, so Marty kind of helped run the team, manage the sponsors, travel, all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, Marty called me one day and he said, "Hey, I got a job." I'm like, "Awesome, cool." It was about two weeks after I started at Hendrick. I said, "Okay, cool." So we're both out of we're both out of Gibbons. We can you know start going on this cup deal and I said what did you find oh dude you're not gonna believe this and I said what he said bullshit baffles brains he said I'm gonna be the team manager for Cranifus Haas and I'm like are you serious this guy from Barry's gonna manage a cup team yeah sure enough he did and killed it wow it was awesome he did a really good job wow so he just so that's how we kind of got in the cup series that's great that's great so what was the jump like from the Gibbons shop to you know, the biggest cup shop in the sport or, or was it at the time? It was, it was big. So the, there were so many employees there, um, that it was overwhelming at first. Um, but you could see how fast they built cars, which was really neat. And, and they had parts guys that would have stuff already made for you to put on the car. So it kind of sped things up a lot. So you and it's the same thing as anything else. Um, you just climb the ladder. So I started at the bottom, um, building parts. Um, then I got a surface plate, hanging bodies, and uh, that company. There's so many people and so many creative people. Like I, I was creative, right? But the people were, that worked there were way more creative than me, mm-hmm. and they taught you everything. So it was really cool. So I, once you, once you have the aspiration to want to do that, and somebody's going to teach you, you catch on really fast. So, so it wasn't, it didn't take me long to learn. And then I was in the, in the gas really hard the whole time. So were you on a specific car when you were first hired or a specific team? No. So the way they did it, their body hanging department, they had four plates and it just, whatever, whatever car got done first, it would come off and then the next car would go on and you just stayed on that plate. So whatever, it didn't matter whose car it was. Um, once the, once you got one done, they'd put the next one on. In time, it did switch to specific teams per plate. So crew chiefs would, obviously, the, the most winning crew chief will get the best body hangers and went down the line. But, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, and maybe I'm fast-forwarding. I don't I don't know. You uh, were a front tire changer. How did that deal come, come about? Because that's... You know, that's different than fa- fabricating parts or hanging yeah. bodies. Yeah, I know, for sure. So, well, when I worked for Peter, we had, you know, to do pit stops. and we were, You have to do everything. Yeah, it was pretty clunky. It wasn't really clean, but we we had we did what we had to do. Yeah. And uh, they had, obviously, f- at the time, there was three cup teams at Hendrick. And they had they were always developing pit crew people mm. and teaching them. And, and the coaching there was really, really good. So, um, at lunchtime and after work, each day I would go down and just hit lug nuts. And the coach would come over. But just for fun or it was encouraged? Because I could see that there was people that would always move up. And there was a little bit of turnover, not a lot. But people would move up and have you'd have opportunity to get on a pit crew, right, and make more money. And at the time, there wasn't, there wasn't like, athletes 
for a picker, right? All the picker was shop guys. Right. So it was guys who were going to the track anyways. Correct. So I'd work with them side by side during the day and then they'd be gone on the weekend and I'd be like, that's really cool. Like I get to work with them and they get to do that too. I'm like, I want to do that. Mm. You know? So I started uh, just hitting lug nuts every day for probably six months and then coaches would start seeing you're getting better. So they give you some pointers and then, then you started getting really good. Right. And um, even though there wasn't an opening for our teams, they farmed a lot of people out. Okay. So they didn't mind. No, they didn't mind at all. No, even, they would even lend you to a cup team just for experience, right? Because the better you got, um, eventually you would help them. So it was, it was, it was good for both sides. Um, so they, f I got sent to, I don't know how many bush teams, probably 30 different bush teams over the years that I changed tires for. And uh, we were at Rockingham one day. I went, with, uh, I went with our cup team. Even though I wasn't on a pit crew, you could still go with the cup team. So I went to Rockingham, and it was a rain out, and they were looking for a tire changer. I, I didn't know at the time. Our coach came down and asked me, hey, do you want to you want to stay here Monday and run the cup race for the 90 car that the Dick Tur Turkle drives for? And I'm like, seriously, like this could be my first opportunity to change tires in the cup series. Right. And they're like, yeah, yeah. So uh, I stayed Monday, and Tommy Baldwin was the crew chief. He also changed tires. Back then, that was normal. And uh, so I changed front tires that day. Uh, Tommy changed yours. I think we finished fifth, which was crazy because to me, I didn't. I think we're supposed to run that good because I'm, I'm from Hendrick, right? We always run that good. Yeah. So they finished. They were like super, super pumped that they finished the top five. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> you know? But, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was my first uh, tire change experience. And then it, and it just took off from there. And were you like, were you, do you remember how nervous you were? Were you pretty nervous for that stop? I was pretty nervous, yeah, but it, it, that same nervousness never goes away. So I changed tires for 10 years, and I was still as nervous when I ended as when I was starting. So, sure. yeah. yeah. There's a lot of pressure. Right. I, and I think that's, you know, I think maybe more and more as, as um, you know, social media and, and you know, uh, the broadcast in, in NASCAR kind of explores different avenues of, of where to point the camera. But I, I think it's really underappreciated by the majority of people, like, just how important that you know potentially that last pit stop is right, right. you know you could you could pass five or six guys without having to actually pass them on the track and go out and be a slower car and win the race just because of those five guys yeah and, and over time it got like i think you were under a microscope you know obviously in the 60s and 70s 80s 90s it got work you got you know it's like you're under a microscope even more and there was more pressure mm -hmm. so you could there was more pressure to gain spots on pit road as time went on. Right. And they seen how we, yeah, I'm not going to say it was easy, but it's easier to pass me on pit road than it is on the racetrack. Right. My goodness. Yeah. yeah. So they really put a lot of pressure and that's, that's what, what created the turnover. So there there's, even though you were on a picker, it didn't mean you were locked in for the whole year because if somebody better than you came along, they're going to pick that person up. Right. Because it's free spots on pit road. Right. right. Right now. And I've seen it now, you know, where they're, they're actively kind of drafting athletes, guys who have grown up since they were kids who are athletes. When did that kind of switch happen in um, the sport? When I was getting out of it, I quit changing tires. I think it was in 2005 or six. I stopped changing tires and it was really ramping up then where they didn't want to use shop guys as much as um, athletes. They wanted, they wanted somebody to work out all day and do pit stops five days a week and not work in the shop. And uh, once the other teams, I'm not saying it was just, we didn't, Hendrick doesn't, he, it didn't start with Hendrick, with athletes, other teams are doing it also. But once they seen the potential, having, having athletes, it really ramped up. Um, and now we have, uh, I think it's probably two or three times a year, we have tryouts. So your, your job's not guaranteed for the whole entire year. Um, they'll, They'll, they'll seek athletes all year long, and if they can find somebody, you'll either get moved to one of the other teams or possibly get bumped out. But it doesn't, it doesn't happen as much anymore because there's so many athletes, um, and they're so good that um, they're going to pay the money to have somebody you know, from a football team or something like that that can outdo any other guy in a pit crew. Right, right. I remember that just being the biggest shock the first time. I, you know, it's like it, this looks like a college – you know, facility for there's a full gym here. There's a football field. There's a track like yeah. crazy. Yeah. And it, it's hard because so when 
we'll back up a little bit. When I got in, into change of tires, I would I would be hanging bodies at the same time. And eventually I got moved to a shop and I was working in the shop because it was harder for me to, to be on that on a specific team but not be in the shop during the day. So they moved me up uh, to the five the five team Terry Labonte was driving. Oh, I see. So you were changing tires for the five team and there on weekends, Correct. but during the week you weren't I'd be back in the body hanging hanging a body on one for any car. car. Yeah. So then they moved you to just the five car yeah. for Terry. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then I, I was in the shop building cars. Um and then going to pit practice workout. So at like nine o'clock I'd be like, All right guys, I gotta go. I'll be back at lunch. And and I come back and the part that I was working on when I left at nine o'clock was on the car done. I'm like well, this kind of sucks. Like somebody else is doing my job, okay. and then I like the pickery side of it. It was a lot of fun. Um, the money's really good, obviously, right. and uh, I was kind of tore between somebody doing my job and the pickery side of it. And you know, as, as I aged, um, younger kids are getting better, right. and we had 600 employees at the time, and I, I didn't want to be the guy that held 600 employees back from a win. Right when these younger kids are coming, athletes are coming, and uh, in nineteen uh, or sorry, in two thousand and four or five, I stopped changing on the five. On sorry, not the five. I changed for quite a few cars at, at Hendrick. I quit changing tires for the whole season, and I did a part time schedule in uh, two thousand and five and six, and then uh, that that was I was done changing tires after that. Okay. Just stayed in the shop. So before this, John John came into my office and he showed me the highlight of you guys passing three guys on pit lane for Terry Labonte to win the Southern 500. Yeah, that was really cool. That was, that was my first cup win. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so Terry Labonte is kind of a neat guy. Um, I know you met uh, Bobby. Yeah, I had him yeah. virtually on the podcast. Yeah. 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 It's a cool family. The, even their dad, like Bob's awesome. Um, but so Terry, if he came to the racetrack chewing a piece of gum, you were going to have a good day. Okay. You could tell. Okay. And he showed up at Darlington and he was, he's from, uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. So he's used to the heat and it didn't like he would never fall out of the seat because he was too hot. Right. And uh, it was really hot that day. And he showed up the racetrack chewing gum and we're like, we should have a good day. You know, we didn't know we were going to win the race. But yeah, we won the race because we beat, beat every off pit road in the last stop. So it was pretty exciting. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, you started and I was just reading your bio. You started something called uh, what was it? Pit crew for kids or something. Yeah. yeah. What, what was that deal? So, uh, because uh, the pickers are like a, a little mini family. Mm -hmm. um, we always went to dinner, um, hung out. Like when we traveled, we'd go hang out. You know, we'd go tour around some um, baseball stadiums and stuff like that. We'd always do stuff together. And it w I thought at Christmas time that one year, it'd be really cool if we could ever get into a hospital with uh, sick kids and take them Christmas presents. Mm -hmm. Like we would buy them. We'd just give them t to the kids. And it, it didn't, I didn't know it was going to, it didn't turn into a huge deal, but it did, it did get the ball rolling pretty good. Okay. Um, so we went, I don't know how many, probably a couple years. We went two or three times a year. We'd go see the kids. We had a connection at work through um, the, Hendrick had a bone marrow program at work. And one of the girls that worked on that side of it kind of hooked us up with one of the kids' hospitals uh, in Charlotte. So we were able to get five or six guys together and, a lot of people bought us gifts, so we had, we'd take a, a big van, fill it full of gifts, and we'd go to the hospital and hand them all out. So it was really cool. It's gratifying, you know, to see uh, kids that weren't going to have Christmas at home um, to try to bring it to the hospital. So it was cool. Nice. So, you know, those early 2000s, you kind of step back from doing the pit crew stuff, and you want to see your projects go start to finish, uh, your parts go start to finish. When... Um, when do you become kind of a an arrow body hanging guy specialist type type dude in the shop as opposed to doing a whole ton of other stuff? So uh, hanging sheet metal, putting bodies on, um, you push the envelope. So you have a basically a build sheet that they would give you, and obviously you have a, the rule book. You have to be within templates. You have to fit. Um, we would kind of start getting creative and push the box every time. And then you could get way outside the box. And some people um, just get really creative and learn how you can do stuff that people can't notice. Uh, so is it all – so you guys obviously have your own templates just like NASCAR does. And for people who don't know, they just – back then, they'd sit them on the car. Yeah, and you got to – Right. And you got to meet, you know, different tolerances between the body and the template. 
was everything that was creative just within those gaps of the template? You know, those places where the template wasn't? That was half of it. Okay. So there was a lot of measurements that N NASCAR used, and they had gauges. Um, so at the time, they were learning that they should keep a wrap on the body connected to the suspension. That way they could uh, police it without getting too far outside the box. Because you can, if a body didn't know where the tires were, you could get really crazy. And NASCAR wanted to keep the body within the tires. Um, I see. So n sh like physically having the body shifted yeah. over left and right. up. Yeah. Okay. So they started making gauges to go with the templates. Mm. And then we would get, you know, ideas how we can try to try to fudge it. Um, so let me tell you about Hendrick a little bit. Yeah. So the people um, and not I mean, people in racing in the south are the best in the business, right? Hendrick has this thing that a lot of other teams don't. And it's just like their culture, like the way they treat people, uh, the way they uh, work together, um, the way they teach you. There's it's it divides um, a lot of teams into like what makes Hendrick better than everybody else. And, and I mean, a lot of the big teams are like that now, but it's the culture. It's like what they what they mold you to be while you're there. And it's the reason why a lot of people don't leave because it's addicting and and uh, is it from the top down? Is it from Mr. H? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like they they have the Kool-Aid, but you want to drink it. Yeah. Right. You want to be part of what they have going on. Yeah. So <clears throat> I learned from the people that were there. Um, some of the some of the smartest people around the best fabricators that you can imagine. Um, they taught me a lot of stuff. And and then you could be then you had the, this creative side that you knew. Hey, you know, I can I can do stuff that maybe the guy beside me won't even notice that I'm doing after it's done. And and those people worked hand in hand with like our aero group. Um, so our aero group would give you an idea. Hey, what if we did this? Could you figure out how to do it? And there was a small group of us that um, that you could see had that concept how to how to do it. Mm. And that that pool of people got smaller. So the aero guys were looking at it, say, how can we, whatever, make more force here on the car or in this specific area on the car? And they'd theorize how to do it and say, can you build it and get away with it? So what we did in the wind tunnel a lot is we would find the sensitive parts of the car where the most fruit were, was. Okay. And we would try to hone in on that and, and try to figure out what it, what made that part of the car so sensitive mm. and, and how can we make that specific spot generate more power than other parts of the car so we would just focus on certain areas and uh just develop try to you know we do crazy stuff sometimes you have to go way outside the box to realize that okay yeah this is where we need to work or, or we don't need to work in this spot anymore sure. so <clears throat> our our aero group would say these are the sp these are the spots we need to work in we know you can't do this shape but can you make something that would mimic it mimic it and, but create the same numbers right the same effect yeah, okay. and uh so it was like a, a a tier right the higher people would would come to us lower people that were creative and then we would do stuff that people under us didn't know we were doing right. and uh and the whole garage turned into that um and an arrow is is only a tool it's just like a shock or a spring um sway bar it's just a it's just something that you can make the back of the car work better or the front or the side Right, it's just a tool, and you can change the balance of the car aerodynamically. Um, so they taught me as I went along, and then you grit scroll like a flower, right? I just I just learned more and more, and I started coming up with ideas, and not just me, smart people yeah. at Hendrick helped everybody, and it and it was it was really cool. It was a a cool journey. I'm still there doing the same thing, yeah. but uh, the car has changed a lot over time. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I was looking at uh, some of those pictures during that kind of era you're talking about in the 05, 06, 07. Can you, because you're going to be able to explain it better than I will, like just how cocked up those cars were and how jacked up they looked, you know, from overhead shots and whatnot. We twisted sisters. We, we had names on all these cars too. We'd, we'd like make nicknames just because we do some crazy stuff. And uh, that specific thing that we did to that car, we just name it, you know, yeah. and uh, 
yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Um, uh, j when, when they come up with a rule, we would just try to twist that rule and try to take out of it what they didn't write in that rule. Right. And there is stuff like there's loopholes and rules still today. You just have to figure out how to do it. Um, in the best way that they can't tell you did it. And if you have to move a seam, so the measurement's different from, from that line to the next line, mm. you could just move stuff around or <laughs> templates. There's there's all kinds of ways to make a template look like it fits, but even though it doesn't really fit, um, you got all the fruit out that you're gonna get out of that spot, so. Right. Now, I don't know if there, I don't know if you can talk about it, but even, you know, do you have some, some a good story or, or a, an example of something that happened kind of in those early 2000 years that that's just, I can't believe we got away with that or we only got away with it for one race or we got caught or we got a slap on the wrist. Yeah. There's, th there's a laundry list, okay. a laundry list of that stuff that, um, cause you do it every day. Like every day is a new cool part. Right. So, uh, there was, uh, I built a, a deck lid for, uh, a car. I was, I ended up moving to the five car. I, I, I latched on one of our crew chiefs and, and he, he carried me from, if he got moved to a different team or a different department and work, he'd take me with him. Um, so we, Kyle Bush was our driver and I made a, a deck lid that would move back. It would move up and back at the start of the race. So we did it. We we're going to incorporate it in all of our cars, but we didn't really know if we were going to get by with it. So we did it for the all-star race at Charlotte. And, uh, I don't, I think Kyle was maybe leading but he got racing his brother and the two of them went into one and they they touched and they both spun coming off a of two and he hit the wall and the deck lid flew off it like instantly so the only thing we didn't realize was that uh, we got everything out of it we wanted but it really wasn't gonna you couldn't you couldn't hurt the car because it wasn't gonna stay on it right. right if it got turned around so it came off right away right how did you get it to move i can't tell you that okay. <laughs> thought i'd ask i, I thought that was the answer <laughs> Cool. Yes, and then I, we got into doing body work too. So, the the position that I was in, to 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 finish the job, you you almost had to do it yourself for two reasons: to get to get everything out of it that you wanted it to look like when it was done and be efficient. But you also didn't you didn't want everybody in the shop to know yeah. what you did because there's some leaks still today in some teams, right? So you you can't let everybody know, and obviously. When you do find something, you kind of want to keep it for a few weeks. It's really hard to keep something in the garage for more than a couple of weeks because somebody they always because everybody's got eyes. Um, nowadays, teams hire photographers, and we get like hundreds of pictures of everybody else's cars every every week, and and they're all doing it too. We're not right. the only ones, but uh, so I got into doing body work um, on the stuff that I would do. Like, and there was uh, there was one of a person in my position on each of our cars at the time and we still do it the same way today and uh, we would we would do our little treatments on the car and then we'd do our body work over top of it and finish it out so yeah. now i guess during that that era there uh, you were probably i'm sure you were recognized as a as a talent there did you get offers from other teams I did. yeah and why what kept you loyal there? I'm sure people were moving around all the time, and that's kind of the norm down there. So being a young guy down there, um, I started to race myself too. Um, and there's a small spot in all of us that has greed, right? So I wanted, I thought I could get more money. Um, so I, st I started search around. There was only one year I did it. I, w I went on two job interviews. I went to Robert Yates, um, interviewed there, and then I went to uh, DEI. And what turned me off was I went to DEI and um, – during my interview, they told me that they don't need anybody to come in here and, and start something new or change what we're doing. We just need a worker to come in here and just mm. build what we're building. And that turned that took my creative side out of it, mm. totally turned me off. And and I knew that where I was was my home. Um, so I never left. I've been there for 26 years. I don't have a, sh a closet full of different team shirts, right? I, I just have Hendrick shirts in my closet. So. Right. Now, was there, and did it change throughout the time, because you've been there f for so many years, the competition between teams? Yeah. How did that evolve? And, and Huge. So going back to the Hendrick culture. So Mr. Hendricks had a vision for our company for, you know, since, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm sure since it started. Um, 
when when it grows that fast and that big um there's always it's always divided um and we had try we had to try to house everybody in in that complex where you can't put everything under one roof so there's different buildings well then you get into competition from one building to the next we had uh at the time i think we had uh jeff gordon was there jimmy johnson um kyle bush was there and i think dale jr was there so I'll, one building would always race the other building like if we could beat those two cars on a weekend then we beat the best in the business the the problem was we couldn't go in their shop and they couldn't come in our shop which from the outside you find that really hard to believe yeah. but from the inside that's how it was like if i walked in their building you would you'd get stared down as soon as you walked in the door and they'd want to know what you were doing there um because they they were under the same assumption if you had a, a product on the car that could w win them the race they want to keep it so they can win they don't want to share it because then you would possibly take a win from them mm. for years mr hendrick said we have to work together and we're stronger together so if we can all have the same parts we can all win right we all get the same bonus we all get paid the same and it took it took a really long time like i like i said i've been there for 26 years and only the past probably eight or ten years we actually worked together and now uh, we are all under one roof like all the f all four teams are under one roof meaning the crew chiefs are in there we assemble the cars the final assembly gets done in the same shop setups get in the same shop we're all like side by side so you can't have a secret between the four cars. The crew chiefs are all in the same meeting every single week. Um, all their notes are shared, which they said they used to share the notes. But you would get you would get like some of their notes on 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 Friday when they left. But then you get their real notes on Monday when they got back. And and that's when you realize then then you realize that what they showed me Friday is not what they raced. And that's that's why we got beat. Yeah. So it's open book now, and and everybody works together. And it and it's like the concept Mr. Hendrick had back then is working now like he proved you can do it and it's and it definitely works now we don't win all the races mm. but if we if one of our cars runs good we all run good and if we run bad we all run bad but we did it together right right so you think that helps absolutely yeah, yeah can be, because i can go to one of the other four guys or four teams and and show them something and they'll be like we tried that it didn't work or dude that's awesome let's let's all four run it this weekend right so together collectively it's it's definitely better having more because you just have more power between f four teams than yeah more data right. you get you get it yeah the response back quicker yeah. for sure huh uh i've got a list of questions because john came up to my office he said okay ask about your eyeball okay. he said anything anytime anytime john says hey i got an idea <laughs> or ask him this i get nervous <laughs> <laughs> i've only got two more <laughs> So uh, I have two kids, and uh, if if you're in racing, you have this massive competitive uh, part of your brain that you're so competitive and you want to win. Um, as my as I so let me go back to when I traveled changing tires. I was gone every weekend, so you'd pack your bag Thursday, get on a plane, take off, come back Sunday. So I would be gone and I would get messages from my wife or my buddies and be like, hey, we took your kids dirt biking this weekend or we went to the pool. And and I was like, man, this really sucks. Like, I'm yeah. it's cool. I have this life at the racetrack, but I'm missing a life with my kids. So. At the end of uh, 2004, I think it was um, it was close to the end of the season. I decided I didn't want to change tires anymore. I wanted to spend weekends at home with my kids. So I did that. Um, I stayed in the shop, worked uh, five days a week in the shop. I still got to travel on weekends because they um, needed a body guy at the racetrack because um, with our old car, if you slap the wall or something in practice, um, you're allowed to fix it. And, and they don't take body guys to the racetrack typically um, as part of the team. So um, they started taking body guys every weekend. So that's how I got traveling, just, just like one day a week instead of four days a week. So I stayed on home on weekends with my kids. Well – since I raced, I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could like carry out my dream, but let my kids race. Okay. So I bought some go-karts and, uh, we started racing and I'm kind of going to jump through this kind of fast just because uh, we can, we can take our time. We'll go back to the eyeball. I'll, I'll remind yeah. you. Ball story. <laughs> so we started racing go-karts. No, because I mean, yeah, 
take your time on this because I think to this day my most fond memories are being at the go kart track with my dad. If you're if if you're a go kart racer, and I'm sure there's a ton of people that you're friends with that are listening to the show that that have go kart raced, the most inspirational part of racing is like when you go kart race it's family oriented and everybody helps everybody and as soon as they plant the seed in you in in go kart racing it carries you all the way through every level that you go through right because it started there and it you you don't know this when you start but you it, it really gets weeded out and and dissolves as you climb the ladder but that's where it started so we really really loved that part of it so we started go kart racing and we did it for i don't know how many years and we were really good at it they okay. I was I built their cars right. and and then I have both my boys were racing and of course they were super competitive yeah. and uh, they they were like Hendrick having two teams they raced each other right they were they didn't care about the whole field they were more they just wanted to beat each other and this is what uh, like quarter midgets or this was a uh, champ carts so we ran the WKA um, go kart series with the champ carts so it was a go kart with a roll cage on it. Right, oval, oval asphalt. We did both. We did road courses and ovals. Okay. Yep, and we did anywhere. F we went all the way from like South Carolina to to uh, New York. Wow. Yeah, and uh, we ran their whole points deal um, for a couple seasons. But um, Cole is my oldest son, and my and Ryan's my my younger one, and the two of them um, got really competitive. Uh, Cole would uh, he was always fast. Ryan was a couple years younger, so he wasn't quite as fast as Cole. And Ryan, um, he's like a social butterfly, so he's hard to keep up with at a racetrack. You know, you have your, his car ready to go, but you can't find him. Yeah. And it kind of, it kind of blended into his lifestyle from there too. So we get up in the morning, super early to go to the racetrack, and I'd wake up Cole and be like, "Hey, we got to go to the racetrack." Ryan, "Hey, we got to go to the racetrack." Ryan's like, "I'm, I'm not getting up. I'm sleeping." I'm like, "You have to qualify in like two hours." I'm just going to stay here. So we go to the racetrack and Cole practiced both cars really? for me because I, Ryan wasn't there. Yeah. So Ryan would show up for qualifying, just show up and get in it and go. And we sat on the front row, uh, nine out of the 10 races. And it was, I think they were, we sat on, I want to say all, every, every, all 10, all 10 races we were on the front row, but nine of them, both of them were on the front row. Oh, okay. It was really cool. So, so while we were racing go-karts, we went to, uh, New York, I think it was we were coming back or Pennsylvania, and uh, it was about three o'clock in the morning. Going through West Virginia, I noticed the 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 chrome piece on the front of my trailer had come off, or it was it was still attached, but it was flopping in the wind. So we pulled over, and I was like, I gotta I gotta get up on the roof and I gotta drill this piece off, you know. So I got up on the roof of my trailer, super dark. We we're in this gas station that was closed. We were the only ones in the parking lot, and. Uh, I started, I didn't have a flashlight, so I was just drilling these pop rivets out, and you know it's like when you don't have the right drill, but you just like hog a thing out, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I was like trying to drill these rivets out, and the drill bit broke, and when it when the drill bit broke, a uh, shard of it went through my eye, um, and it went like all the way through it, cleaned everything out, like, it was bad, <laughs> it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was walking around the drill bit sticking out of my eye, there was a piece of it that went through, and uh, it cut, it went all the way back and cut my retina. So we're on the side of the road, and I was, I was like shaking my head. My wife's like, "You all right?" And I'm like, "It's really bad." And she's like, what, "What's wrong?" And I'm like, "It's bad." So she, at the time, she didn't even know. So I, I jumped down, got the piece off, jumped down off the roof, and it was like when you dump cooking oil in a in a bowl of water, it all separates. Well, all I could see was like black, but it was like all separated. So I knew there was something bleeding, but it wasn't. Oh, you couldn't see it, right? She couldn't see it. So I was like, hey, we have to go to a hospital, but I'm not going to a hospital in West Virginia. Yeah. I'm like, we're going home. Yeah. <laughs> so she drove the truck and trailer back to Mooresville. The kids were in the back seat sleeping. Uh, Did it hurt? It didn't hurt that bad. Okay. So fast forward in the surgeries, they hurt way more than what the actual injury did. Mm -hmm. But no, it didn't really hurt. We got home, dropped the kids off at our house. A friend of ours took them to school. I think it was, I don't know, it was kind of a blur to me at that point. And then her and I went to the hospital in Charlotte, and they did surgery at, like, noon, I think, something like that. And when when the piece went through my eye, there's a – you have a lens in your eye that's kind of like a camera mm. that helps everything focus. And once you damage uh, the lens, they can't 
they can't fix it. They just have to take it out. And there's a little sack that the lens is actually in. Well, it cut the they cut the lens, the sack, retina, everything. They reattached the retina, but I didn't have a lens, so I couldn't. I could see light, but I couldn't make anything out of that out of that eye. So I always use this example to people like the our car numbers on our door. Race cars are huge, right? Yeah. And if I covered my good eye, I, c I couldn't even make out what that was. And that was in, I think it was like April or May, somewhere around there. I waited till New Year's Eve and had an artificial lens uh, put in. Oh, so you lived half a half a year. Yeah. Like f totally blind in one eye. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And worked. Wow. Huh. <laughs> so yeah, I had an artificial lens put in uh, New Year's Eve, and then I was uh, 2080 in one eye and 2020 in the other eye. So I'm still like that today. Okay. Uh, that's the story then. Yeah, that's my eyeball story. Uh, so do you think... You know, my uh, going to the the track. I just look at. I, I'm thinking. I'm trying to think about you guys go kart racing. How much of an advantage your boys would have having you as their fabricator and crew chief compared to a lot of the guys? And did that, um, you know, racing go karts or even late models or whatever it be down in the southeast compared to say up here? Just how many guys are working full-time in a cup shop and also at those races, you know, supporting their kids in go-karting. Yeah. Like, how, how much more competitive is it down there be just because of everyone's dad is, you know, a wizard compared to some guy who's a, an accountant up here? Yeah, like, the competition level there is huge, right? Like, you can be a small fish <laughs> at a big pond down there or you can be a, a, a the opposite up here. Yeah. And, and uh, the competition level there is, you know, huge. It's it makes it really hard to to gain a lot of ground because you're everybody wants the same thing there. So everybody's asked the same sponsor to you know, hey, we need help. Um, they've already been in every door around there. Um, that that part of it is really hard. Mm -hmm. As far as being um, a cup guy and racing in a smaller division like go karting for your kids and stuff, I don't know that it's a a huge advantage. Honestly, okay. it's just like I said, it's a tool. Aero, aerodynamics is just a tool. Right. Um, but what we did have that other people didn't have is the desire to make like the nicest, coolest shit out there, okay. right? So our cars were beautiful, right. and and I didn't do it by myself. And I, I'm not the smartest guy. I'm not like the best guy in the business. I'm pretty modest, you know. Um, but we had fun, and and I I I hate going to the racetrack if like you have dirty wheels in your car. You can't put your car in the trailer if you got, like wax the whole car but the wheels still have brake dust in them from the last yeah. race. You have to clean. Everything has to look nice always. So we we, we paid attention to detail really um, on all of our stuff for all the years that we raced. And I think um, talking to people like uh, my one son, like I said, is a social butterfly. My other son is really quiet. And I'm – I would say I'm in the middle, but they're going to tell you that I'm, I probably talk more than anybody, <laughs> but I would go around and talk to people and learn. Right. And that, that was another piece that was an advantage because I would ask a lot of people about, you know, different parts of the car, what, what, what makes it tick and, uh, just get a notebook and, and make, you know, all the, get all the stuff you can get, put it in your notebook and then you can use, you, you, it basically translates as you go up level to level. Right. So um yeah that's i think that was the advantage that we have it wasn't really because you were a cup guy i think it's just because we're programmed different because like the quality of work that we have our cars are so nice and you go to you know like a, a short track somewhere else so they're a little bit rougher right so i would always really thrive on making the most nicest pieces and cars and parts and everything right so then uh with with Cole, your oldest son, you guys went uh, late model racing and super late model racing, like when he was pretty pretty young. Yeah. Um. So when we were racing go karts, um, this is kind of a funny story. I tell a lot of people this. Um, uh, we got back from a race in New York, and like I said, Ryan didn't like to practice a lot, and the rougher the track was, the more he hated it. Okay. And um, we got home from a race, and he said, "Hey, Dad." I still remember this. I'll never forget this. In my shop, I have a staircase going upstairs, and he was sitting on the stairs. And he said, "Hey, Dad, I, you can go ahead and sell all my all my stuff." And I'm like, "What? What are you talking about?" And he said, "I don't, I don't think I want my go kart anymore." I'm like, "Why?" And he said, "Well, there's more 
sad days in racing than there is good days. And I'm like, damn, this guy's got to figure it out. Yeah. Right? He's totally, totally correct. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't like that aspect of it, which is fine. You know, it's I totally get it. Yeah. And I so I'm not going to sell it yet. I'm going to let you think about it. But if you decide that you don't want to do it anymore, you're not going to hurt my feelings, right? right? Life goes on. We'll find something else to do. And, uh, yeah, from that day on, he was done, And which I don't blame him. I, I totally get it. It's a competitive sport. Um, you got to be wired, you know, a different way to, to be a racer, to do it full time, or, or even not, even if you do it on a part time schedule, to, to go back every weekend and get beat down and, and want to come back to do it again. Um, it, it'd be like a bad golfer, right? You hit the ball in the woods all the time, and who'd want to do that and, and keep coming back? But that's how, that's what racers do. So, uh, we got, uh, we got through friends in Canada. Um, Scott Nagel, um, is part of the Shepherd, Pete Shepherd family clan over there yeah. uh their son wanted to race bandoleros so they purchased one through uh, a friend some friends that we had in, in the south and we bought basically their whole program and uh scotty would come he would just fly down and we kept all their stuff at my house we would maintain it and scotty would come down and, and race on wednesday nights at, at lowe's motor speedway so they ended up buying another car so they had a spare and because scott wasn't down a lot there was two cars sitting in my garage right and cole's got this like hey we should we should race one of these things yeah. so i got i got talking to scott and he's like yeah yeah take take it out you know do whatever i don't care we start beating the bush a little bit about this and and got, and got some sponsors for, for the sponsor. bandolero yeah. okay yeah Mr. mullins yeah of course we wanted to make it look good so we we got it wrapped and then uh we ran some races and he did really really good and it's like this is we didn't win races right away, but you can see the potential, right? When you start racing, if you're competitive and, and you can make moves that other people aren't making, you, you, you want to go more, right? So so we got talking to Marty Gaunt. Marty's like, hey, I'll sponsor you guys. So he gave us money. We, we got another car. And what was – explain what Marty was doing at this time. Oh, let me back up. Yeah. So Marty bought uh, Bill Davis Racing. Um, he had went to a truck team. And I think he might have been a part owner or something in a truck team, but then he went and got um, – part he bought out bill davis racing somehow you know marty bullshit baffles brains somehow he bought out bill davis racing uh he sold the whole race car side and then grew the engine side he kept the engine side but took the money and, and built it up really big um which turned in into triad um technolo racing technologies in mooresville and he ended up moving shop from where their team was to mooresville uh, i think he got another building and then got connected with Toyota, and it really took off for him in that side yeah, building Toyota engines. Yeah, Toyota engines. And he got the sheet metal side also. So down south, what happens, or at the time, when we were running our steel body cars, you had to run a stock roof, hood, and trunk lid. Mm. So the, the manufacturers would give you stock roofs, hoods, and trunk lids. And, and the hoods and deck lids had liners. So you had to run the trunk, you had to run the, the deck lid liner as a rule. Um, all that stuff for the Toyota side went through Marty. So Marty housed all that stuff, um, and they, they don't just sell it to anybody. Like, he couldn't – a Chevrolet guy couldn't go there and buy it, right? So he, he managed all that. Um, so he – I know he didn't get anything out of sponsoring our Bandolero, right. but he wanted to help us. That's how Marty is. And that's – from my impression, that's how a lot of the, the Canadian guys down there kind of all helped each other out. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you know somebody from Canada there – like, I, I talk to people. A friend of ours actually works at Gibbs, and we, we talk all the time. And, and uh, the Canadian connection, you always kind of – keep those people close to you right so but yeah marty always took care of us we marty and i are great friends still today um obviously he's their uncle so he takes care of them yeah so he sponsored you guys and uh and now you're you know you're out of go-karts with with cole and you're off to the races yep so we went to our first race was at uh i think it was at dillon speedway which is a three eighths mile um for one of those little bandoleros so it was like a super speedway right but uh, we went there. Same thing. I learned a lot of a lot of things from other people, not necessarily my doing, right? And uh, built my notebook. And we went there and won the very first race that we ran that year. And uh, Charlotte was tougher for us. Um, the there's the pool of people at race there is obviously huge compared to you know some other tracks that we would go to. But it was just hard. the competition was super hard there. Um, the racing, you know, like. You, you can blame it on whoever you want, but the racing's rough, right? right. So they kind of knock people out of the way and stuff. So we, we had a harder uh, run at it at Charlotte. We still ran good, um, but uh, it was it was difficult. And uh, I really had this itch 
to get a late model. Um, I, hel I helped a guy that I work with. He had a late, uh, late model. He had some super late models, actually. And uh, I, I myself built a brand new super late model when I moved um, here with Peter. Uh, when I was working for Peter, I kind of still wanted to race. Um, even though I only ran hobby cars, I wanted to race a super late model because that's where it was at down here. The biggest class was super late models. They had late model stocks and some other smaller classes, but super late models was they had the big 10 series at Concord Speedway. And I really wanted to run the big 10 series. It was only 10 races. I could kind of squeeze it in between work and, and that. Well, what I didn't know is uh, when I got on at Hendrick, pretty quickly I started changing tires, right? So the as soon as once I got my car done, I was at Hendrick by that at that point, but I was gone on weekends mm. now. And I, I was like, what am I you know what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna be able to race. Yeah. But this tire changing deal is really good gig. Like I can make money doing this. Um the big ten series dissolved mm. at Concord. So now I was kind of sitting on this car that I didn't know where I was gonna race it. So I decided that I really should be an adult and sell my car and buy a house. Okay. So I sold my car and I took that money and put it on a deposit for my house and I bought a house. But I still had this itch that I wanted a late model. And I was to the point where I think I was too old, getting too old to start over again racing. But I had this kid with a lot of talent that I still wanted to see how far we could go. Uh, so a guy that I, like I was saying that I work with, that I was helping, had a, he had a couple cars and he had, he had a car that he had flipped over and wrecked um, that he wasn't going to use anymore. It was just sitting there. And he was going to give me this killer deal. He gave me a bunch of parts with it and stuff. So I bought it. Mm -hmm. And they were starting a new series. Um, it was a northern series. It was a past, so, uh, past Super Late Model series up, out of Maine. We're going to start this past south Pro Late Model series. And uh, it was a brand new series. I read the rules. It seemed like it was pretty economical, smart, great motor. With a, It was like a Pro Late Model. Okay. So when, uh, when Cole was 12, I got that car home. And I said, listen, for a guy at 12, it's a huge dream, right? Like, oh, I'm going to yeah. race this car. It's badass. Yeah. Um, but I'm not going to do it alone. So I said, if you want to do this, you know, you're going to be in the shop with me yeah. doing it. Yeah. So, and, and actually, I, that, yeah, I kind of started in the go-kart days. I made him work. Like, Cole was always in the shop on the go helped me with go-karts. Um, and then Bandoleros, um, he actually got into, like, I, I knew how to wrap cars at work, but then he started doing all the decals and wrapping because he saw me doing it. And he he kind of he didn't ask really. He just started doing it like he's one. Of, he's self taught. He can self teach on a lot of stuff. If he just if he sees you do it, he can do it. So we started rebuilding this late model. Um, it was it was bad. <laughs> I should have just bought another car. <laughs> but it's one of those things you yeah. get started on. You're so upside down in it, but I couldn't stop. Yeah. And uh, we just had to get it done. So we got it done. I told him though, we ran go karts, ran bandoleros. I don't want a points race okay. because it's so hard on you and, and it's already addicting all consuming. Right. And I was like, I, it's going to kill us. Yeah. So the only way that we're not going to points race is if I don't let you start the first couple races because yeah. you're out of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I was like, all right. So we went, our car wasn't really ready at the time anyway, which worked out perfect. We went to the first couple races and, uh, okay. Get our car done. Let's go. Wow. Uh, we started racing and he was like on kill at 12. I'm like, we're racing guys. You know, obviously there were some younger kids there too, but there was guys my age yeah. that he was racing and we ran the top three, like every single night. I think it was, he can probably answer this better than me, but it might've been our third race or something. We won. Um, Oh, second race, <laughs> <laughs> second race in a prolate model. We won it at, uh, what track was it, Cole? Motor Mile, Virginia. Yeah, yeah. Half, it was almost, uh, it was It was a big, I don't know if it was three-eighths or half-mile. It was a big track. But it was, yeah, our, our, our second race out, he won. Did that shock you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is a little kid. So we got the car done, and we are like, we got to go test it first. We went to Hickory, uh, which is about 30 minutes from our house, and I was like, let's go shake this down. And at the time, we didn't really have it set up. It was just let, let's let's get him out there and let's get it rolling. Make sure we got everything on the car that it, that we need to make it go, and then we'll come home and fine tune it. And I still remember he came out of turn four one time and had the thing dead sideways, and I'm like, he just junked this car yeah. and drove out of it. I'm like, damn, this this kid might have some talent. You know, it might be pretty good here. But anyways, uh, yeah, right away, 
uh, he took off on the thing and we won a bunch of races come to the end of the year. We had won so many races. We were like second in points, even though we missed the first couple races yeah. and we we're like, damn, we might be able to win this thing. Yeah. <laughs> so and we ended up finishing second in points that year, but, uh, yeah, right, right back in the points deal again. So I think, uh, we ran a couple races the next year and they, they were starting a new series called the cars tour yeah. series, yeah. which was going to pay a lot of money. Um, they were hoping to draw on bigger name drivers, um, a bigger car count, you know, bigger, better tracks. Uh, it was really appetizing. So we, we built a brand new car. I think we ran a couple pass races with it and we, we built it so fast. I didn't, I didn't paint the chassis. I said, let's just build this thing, get it done. Let's go to the track and let's see if, if it's a good car. So when the car steward was getting ready to start, we're like, let's let's strip this thing real quick and we'll paint it. And Marty was still helping us. So we're like, okay, let's we'll paint the chassis, put the body back on. It was gonna go quick because it was already put together. Um, wrapped it and uh, went to our first race, which was at Southern National Speedway. It was the first cars tour race. And th nobody really knew what the car count was gonna be like, right? Because it was a new series. Super late models. I, fr I left that part out. We went, we, yeah, we got to supers. We went from pro late models to supers. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of mine is so how old's Cole now like 14 or 15 or something uh 14 I think he was when when so uh, the guy that I worked with that ran late models super late models his name is Preston Peltier him and I are really good friends uh he helped us through the whole journey of late models pros supers everything he helped us um when we were running pros though he built a brand new car to go to the, the all-american 400 and it was like the best thing he's ever built like it, when you build cars even to me today like people ask me at work don't, don't you get pissed off like when they wreck them i'm like no because you get to build it better again yeah. right every time you do it it's better yeah. um well he built the best car he could build at the time he's built better cars since but at the time that was the best thing he's ever built and he said listen i want to go to to back to southern national to race this weekend i want to take my all-american 400 car there though and just shake it down but i'm going to run because i think he, at the time he was running for points preston was but he said, Cole, I want you to drive my All-American car there. Like, just shake it down. I would just want you to run at the back. Just run a couple laps and we'll park it. And that way I know I can take it to Nashville, get all the bugs worked out of it. So <laughs> we put him in the seat. And, of course, he didn't fix. He was so small. Yeah. So people, my wife about killed me over this one. People are going to laugh. We packed fuel cell foam all around him, <laughs> which made him fit the seat pretty good. It's almost like a fake liner, right? Yeah. Thinking back, it was the stupidest thing we could ever did. But, uh. Yeah, so we put fuel cell foam around him, and he went, and uh, I he was really fast. Like, he went out in practice, and it was like, damn, he's pretty fast in this thing. Never ran a super before. Yeah. And uh, he we did. We started the race, ran, a, I don't know, we probably ran more laps than we planned on. I think we ran 20 or 30 laps. And uh, we're like, okay, let's just park it. We don't want to wreck it because that was, that was the best car Preston had, right? Yeah. And uh, then he had the itch. I, I, want a, I want a super. Go with the power. Because it was, like, you're talking – I think a prolate model probably makes 400 horsepower, somewhere around there, 350, 400 horsepower. A super makes like 630 to 650. Yeah, that's fast. So we're like, okay, so we talked to Marty. We bought a motor for our prolate model and uh, put the super motor in our pro, which made it a super. And then after we ran, finished the year out, a couple races, we decided to build a new car, and that's how we ended up taking the car apart to paint to go run the Cars Tour. So – we go to the very first cars tour race, and uh, I think we were the last or second last car to practice or to qualify. We, we were decent in practice. We were actually pretty good, like a top ten car. I think they had thirty. I'm gonna guess at thirty five cars they had there, but some of the best talent in in the South for super late model racing. And there's there's kind of three big series that run down in the South for super late models, um, and they drew people from all all the series, big name guys. And it was like the cream of the crop, and we just wanted to make the race, which would have been, you know, that's respectable. Yeah, it would be respectable. Um, I know uh, Bob Pollard was there, Kyle Bush was there, but he wasn't driving. That's when he had got hurt. Um, I think he had a broke leg. He was sitting on top of his trailer, yeah. and Christopher Bell was driving his car. Um, we went out there and sat on the pole. Really? And I was like ecstatic. Like I, I couldn't believe that we were fast enough to get the pole. I knew we were like we we're gonna. I figured we'd make make the top ten. Sat in the pole. We didn't lead every lap, but we won the race. Wow. Uh, we were we led a lot of laps. We probably led half, maybe half the race, but we ended up winning the race, which was massive, right? Especially yeah. the the people that you beat there. Um, so we ran the the 
the series that summer we decided not to run pass races anymore we're gonna run the cars tour series back to points racing yeah. and uh about killed ourselves doing it uh it's a lot of maintenance on those cars right and when we were running prolate models um he was fast right so he nerfed somebody out of the way and the next week i put a nose and, and all the new duct work in the radiator and i got to a point where i'm like dude if if you keep knocking noses off you gotta you're gonna have to put them on yourself because i'm not doing it anymore yeah. you're the one that's doing it not me right you're the one knocking them off but yeah. anyways so he learned pretty quick that we need to take care of the car and uh he he got really good um we ran the cars tour series that year and then winning the points um in 2015 which is super impressive massive yeah it was huge yeah so uh it was a lot of fun and th at the time though um which is c kind of funny but it's it's pretty gratifying you look back at it it's two guys in a two-car garage with a 24-foot trailer racing kyle bush motorsports it has like three full-time employees a stacker trailer like they had everything they bought us as many tires as they wanted to buy in practice every race right we buy two sets you know on a weekend and won won the points championship that year which is it was yeah. pretty impressive and guys who are super late model racing for a living yeah yeah it was fun but at the same time you also look at the scope of things and it's like i can't i can't keep going at this level right with with the kind of money we were bringing in and and we're not i'm not a sp sponsor hunter guy i'm not very good at asking somebody for money i can't stand it yeah it's uh it's tough it takes a special person to be able to do it and execute it right mm -hmm. and uh we tried to get some sponsors and it uh it just didn't work out and i couldn't keep going mm -hmm. and to to work all day now my job i work crazy hours i, w I usually work four to five hundred hours of overtime every single year wow. and then go home and rebuild your super late model because we're going to go race on this weekend so it's just it, it was hard but the the money part of it really was was keeping us from getting better sure. and i know that as talented as, as Cole was, I was holding him back, mm. both financially and um, I'm a fabricator. I'm not a crew chief, right? I don't wear I don't wear that hat. Yeah. So I did the best I could do, yeah. and I think the biggest regret I have, I think I wish I wish I would have used money on a crew chief, like hired somebody to run the deal okay. instead of me. But I was too egotistical and, and thought I want to do everything myself and save money, right? And I, it would it would have helped him out a ton. I th I, oh yeah, definitely would have helped us. Okay. But I could get the car close, and yeah. he would he would drive it however it was, right? right? But uh, yeah, that is the only regret I have. But uh, we had fun; it was a blast, and and eventually we, we dwindled down to running like a partial schedule, yep. and then we ran some big races, Snowball Derby, All American Four Hundred, um, and then you know we just realized that we can't keep up with these guys anymore. Yeah. It just got huge, and now it's actually really changed to where um. It's all, I shouldn't say all. There's a lot of a lot of drivers are just they just show up and drive. Right. It's all it turned into a huge rental deal yeah. across the whole garage area for super late model racing. Yeah. Um, it's really changed quite a bit. So, um, it's a, a, a two guys with a, a car in their little garage at home's really hard to go and beat those guys that do it every single week and the money they have behind them, right? So, so we kind of hung our hat up on that deal. Um, but both your boys now explain what they're doing. You must be super proud. Super proud, Dad. Man, I can't. Uh, I got <laughs> every everybody thinks their kids are their best, right? Of yeah. course, I think my kids are their best. And I know, I know in my heart, they're. I I'm truly blessed. Like I couldn't I couldn't ask for a better couple boys. Um, we hung our hat up on the on the late model deal. We held on to the car for quite a while in case we were gonna race some more, or got a sponsor or something. Um, Cole was just graduating from high school. And uh, we met some people through racing. We went to a party, uh, like kind of a Christmas party thing, and talked to David Gill. And, and David's like, hey, if you're done school, um, you can come, to the, come work for us. Because you know, we'll he was probably just starting his team at that point. Correct. Well, he, he had, he'd had some late models and stuff at his house, but he had, uh, he had kind of grown his business to it. He moved to Mooresville, um, moved up, got some trucks and stuff. Uh, so... Cole went to work for him full time. Uh, it turned into a really good deal. It was great for him because he he got to you know live out his dream working on cars and trucks and stuff. And uh, we had got uh, while we were racing, talked to some Toyota people, 
and they sponsored us for five races to run a Toyota car, like under the Toyota umbrella. Okay. Um, so he drove for David in five races. The very first race, I'll get it back up a little bit again. Sorry, I, I told you I talked like crazy. No, no, it's good. It's great. Uh, I lost both my parents uh, due to cancer. My dad was sick in the hospital at kind of around the same time when Toyota asked Cole to run five races. Uh, they were going to put him in a David Gillen car. And this is a super. Uh, yes, okay. it's a super late model. So at the time, the way their program worked is is uh, they had scouts looking for drivers um, to put in their Toyota family, and they would plug you in a bigger team um, to see you know your potential. Uh, so I went to Canada during his first race, which killed me because I never missed any of his races, right? So my dad and I um, watched his race on my computer in the hospital bed, and uh, Cole went to Tri County in North Carolina in his first race for David Gillen, uh, sat in the pole, won the race, like murdered him. And uh, it was a, like a cool story. Maybe my dad were in the hospital screaming because we were so happy, right? And, and for the Toyota deal, it was big because it was a huge impact, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of eyeballs. A lot of eyeballs, yeah. Um, I, was, I still remember this story because I, I don't know if he'll tell the story the, the same way. But so when I got home, I talked to his crew chief. And his crew chief's like, man, I'm telling you, that kid's like unbelievable. We only use, he only used like, like normally you'd burn about 15 gallons of gas in 150 laps super late model race. I think, I think Derek said it was only like, he only used like eight or 10 gallons. Okay. And, and he said, we were, we were running like half, we got to like halfway through the race. And he said, he's like running, I think he was, I don't even know where he was running second or third, about a half a lap behind the leader. And uh, he said, Hey, are, are you okay? And Cole's like, yeah. Cole, quiet the way he is. He's just quiet. And Derek's like, uh, well, wh why don't you get going and, and see what you got? And Cole's like, well, I was, yeah, I was just saving my stuff. And he's like, all right, yeah, just go ahead and let's see what we got. And he, like, caught caught the leaders from half a track and then almost lapped the field. Like, it was stupid how fast it was. was yeah, it was a really cool story. Uh, so he went on to race the, f the, f the five races. And it kind of – David got bigger, and the cars kind of digressed. Um, by the time we ran our, our last, our fifth race, it was kind of like the worst car in the stable. Mm -hmm. Still did good with it, but it, it, uh, you kind of went down the ladder on, as far as the quality of the cars we were getting. But anyways, uh, so where were we? What was I supposed to talk about next? Just where he's working now and okay. how, how that all came about. We'll go work for David full time, uh, on his, on his trucks. And, uh, he wanted to get to the cup series too. And I said, listen, I can talk to some people at work. Well, and explain, and your, your wife also works for Hendrick. She does, yeah. She started there in the gift shop and then went to um, a, the administra administrative building. She was kind of like a receptionist there. And then she went to um, move down to our central parts. We have a big parts department that houses all the parts and then distributes them to the different parts departments at Hendrick. She worked down there and then moved into um, an apparel role where the, um, her and her boss take care of all the drivers, uniforms, helmets, gloves, shoes, all the employees travel, um, bags, clothing, shop clothing. So they, so they, the two of them kind of dispute all that stuff through Hendrick. So she, she, her and I are working there. He wants to get in the cup series. So I said, listen, I could talk to some people. And he said, no, I don't, I don't want you to help me mm -hmm. because I don't want people to think that, oh, your dad got you a job at Hendrick. I, I get it. Yeah. I said, okay just left it at that and about a week or two later he said hey i got a job and i'm really where and he said uh rpm richard petty motorsports mm. and he went there on his own and uh got a job on his own did it did it himself and uh he's underneath mechanic over there traveled full you know traveled every weekend with them and uh, he really liked it <laughs> and there was some turnover at hendrick it was getting close to the end of the year and i said hey listen we have some no openings if if you want to come over um i was kind of trying to encourage him only because bigger teams had more perks sure. right so we have our own jets um some of our like our clothing was really cool there's just a lot of perks our bonuses were better there's just a lot of perks um he really didn't want to leave um because of the people mm -hmm. at rpm and it was a hard decision for him to make but I was really pushing him to come there. He might hate me for it, <laughs> but he eventually uh, went over to the 88 um, 
interviewed with Greg Ives and moved from RPM to Hendrick and worked for the 88 car being underneath mechanic. So that was his uh, entrance to, to Hendrick. And then he's grown since he's been there. He switched over to the nine car uh, where he's a mechanic there. And uh, they moved their interior guy. The inter an interior guy takes care of the driver's seat, um, the inside of the car, steering wheel, pedals, mirrors, um, all the padding around them, stuff like that. And then you also do the driver's uniform, helmets, shoes. You got to maintain it. So just because they have it, those guys don't have time to clean their helmets and shoes and, and fire suits and stuff, right? So their interior guy maintains all their all their apparel and stuff, safety equipment, and the inside of the car. And he's a mechanic, right? So kind of wears a lot of hats over on that team. But he's done really well. Um, yeah, so that's where he's at. And then uh, my younger son, so my kids are to this day – One's 24, Cole's 24, Ryan's 22, um, and Ryan got into painting RC cars. Okay. I didn't really see where this was going to go, yeah. but he was he did a good job. It was kind of cool. It's like, yeah, that's a neat little hobby. Yeah. And uh, he was in school, wanted to be a machinist, so he started taking night classes, doing machining, um, tool and die classes. And I got him a job at um, a carburetor place, paint carburetors. So I said, when you're done school – this guy is going to hire you, so you have a place to go. So he was getting close to the end of all of his schooling stuff, and my wife had to take helmets to off-axis because that's where um, two of our drivers get their helmets painted. So Ryan went with her one day, and he's like, hey, this is this kind of cool, and I, I do a little bit of painting. Maybe I can do some part-time stuff here. So Greg offered him a part-time job there, sanding helmets at night during the day whenever he could get there. And uh, it evolved a little bit. He started just painting the base color on the helmet. And uh, Greg told him, if you, if you think you can do this, if you want to be an artist here, paint a helmet. Okay. The whole thing, start to finish. We're not going to help you. And then we'll grade you, mm. basically. Cool. So he went to his brother <laughs> and said, hey, can I paint one of your helmets? Yeah. And Cole's, you know, on a limb it's like you know i don't know what this thing's gonna look like but yeah sure go ahead yeah. and he it's amazing he killed it very first helmet and uh right away they're like yeah you you got this. you got the job yeah and, and he's uh at that time he's at the entry level of painting helmets right they have four artists there um and they're one of their artists there is it, it's incredible um he he can do portraits which is the hardest thing to do right sure. Because uh, you don't have a stencil. You can't, like, print a picture and, and just stick on a helmet clear over it, right? A portrait's, like, hand done with an airbrush. Yeah. And Noel over there does that. But uh, uh, they have, like I said, four artists. There's Greg um, that owns the company. Super – the environment there is super cool. Okay. Um, they go in there, and they don't have a – like, they don't have a, a work schedule. Like, we don't work, you know, 8 to 4 or whatever. Um you have a schedule. Hey, we this helmet has to be done Friday or Monday or whatever, right? Whatever you got to do to have it done, that's your schedule. Okay. You make your hours. Cool. So that's what he does. He goes in. Uh, some days he comes home at four thirty in the morning. Yeah. Uh, some days he comes home at five o'clock at night. Yeah. But he loves it. It's cool. They they just kind of go at it at their own pace, and he does a really good job. Yeah, so yeah, it's cool. neat. So the whole family's in racing. Whole family's in racing. So to get back to to your role and this past year like with the whole sport has changed dramatically with the new car how has that changed i guess if you could talk a little bit about that like there's there's a whole ton of rules like way less cars how is you know every piece is totally different how has your role changed uh because of the new car okay so uh the new car it took uh, uh a car from you would english wheel pretty much every panel on our old car you would hand make every every part except for the hood, roof, and trunk lid. The nose and tail were fiberglass. The whole, like, or sh I should say Kevlar, still are today, right? Everybody uses the same nose and tails, basically, other than the, the manufacturer difference. Um, went from a handmade body because there was too much creativity, and, and NASCAR couldn't keep a lid on it. Um, no matter what gauges, templates, measurements, they, they couldn't keep a lid on it. So they decided to come out with a common car um, where – they had control of all the body panels um, and the chassis and the suspension. So it turned into a kit car, basically. And it came with a really thick book, 
how to assemble this car. And it's like Lego, like, come on, we're in racing. We don't need a book to tell us how to put a car together. But you really do. Because this car, the way it's put together, um, it's very, um, some of the parts are really compact, saying that, meaning you can't get to that part if, by the time you put the next part on, it. it's so hidden, you can't get back to it. So if you don't follow this book, you're going to have to go undo five things to put the one that you skipped over back in. So that part of it's uh, made it pretty hard. The body uh, is basically a flange fit um, with conicals, like these locking blocks where you can't, you can't manipulate any of the any each panel to each other. You can't manipulate anything anymore. They, they mate the same. Effort. Correct. You can't heat the panels. Um, as for all the the bending and twisting and pulling we used to do is gone away. Um, so the way the way Hendrick is, good hearted man helps. And let me tell you this, Mister Hendrick helps. People don't even know the people he helped. Like he doesn't tell anybody. He helps so many people um, on the street. Um, in the worst parts in Charlotte, um, like buying them a car, just people that don't even know it's coming. He doesn't want any recognition. He just does it, instills that in the company, right? So, uh, he, through the whole COVID thing that we had going on in the world, uh, we didn't lose any employees. Nobody even went without a paycheck. He told everybody to go home. However long this is going to last. I will still pay you. Don't worry. You'll still have a job here. Uh, and he, he held that up like he's an incredible guy. Uh, this new car came along, and a lot of teams and employees were worried that, we're, that people are going to lose their jobs over this because it's not going to take the manpower to build a car that's a kit. Right. So Mr. Hendricks uh, – got some people at work that kind of search right for different avenues. And we picked up a military deal through Chevrolet to build off-road vehicles uh, for Chevrolet. So their mindset was like, if we can launch this, we won't have to get rid of any employees. Right. We can just move people around. So it did, it took off. Uh, it's a, it's a huge part of Hendrick. Now I know they're going to build a big facility uh, next to our race shops right now, just to house all this. Uh, so we haven't lost any employees. I know, um, Gibbs and I think uh, Penske, Stuart Haas, they they lost like 150 to 200 people, wow. right, over this new car, yeah. just because that you don't you can put a car together, you put the whole body on in a day compared to our we used to do it in four to five days mm -hmm. a steel body, um, you can pretty much assemble a whole car in in five days like start to finish this thing can be race ready going on the track in five days, uh, so that part of it changed a lot um, the creativity's almost out the window right because you can't you know you can't really have your free will to do whatever you want with body panels uh and then there's an underwing which the underwing changed the whole dynamic of all of our cars that we've like it took all of our wind tunnel notes um anything we ever thought worked is gone explain the underwing so the underwing is it totally seals off the underneath of the car where our old cars were partially open so there's the floor underneath the driver and some of the center section was was flat. If you looked underneath the car, it would just look flat, right. kind of sealed. This new car is like you can't even see in full belly pan, full belly pan, front to back. Um, so so to ex you guys were putting those before this car, the old cars, you were putting them in the wind tunnel and you were playing around with o that, those openings. Correct. Yeah, where yeah. how air bounced off all that stuff. Yep. Angles um, where you could. So. Air, air always takes the easiest path, but when it gets to a confined area, it speeds up and accelerates. Um, and if you can figure out where to use the air to your advantage, what angle it wants to visit underneath the car, um, there's a jet where there's a sweet spot. It needs to be to go the fastest way underneath your car to get out. The air doesn't want to stay under your car. It wants to go in the front, out the back as fast as it can, but, but you want to use the power that it has to your advantage. Um, and it was hard to do that with the old car because it wasn't sealed. So you had to like use the panels that were underneath there to your advantage to make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, this new car is 100% sealed underneath. They did their homework and they figured out how to make sig a significant amount of downforce under the car. Yeah. So we didn't have to work on the outside of the car. So now 80% of our downforce comes from under our car now. And only 20% on the outside, which 
which now we're like, okay, I guess we don't need to work on the outside. And that's exactly what NASCAR wanted. They didn't want us to work on the outside of the car and, and bend the rules and stuff. They wanted to have control, and they did it. I mean, they did a really good job of it. So today, basically all my time spent in the underwing. Um, now, what are what are you guys allowed to do? Or is that totally not allowed to touch it? And how did how did all that kind of shake out this year? So NASCAR's always had tolerances. Um, so they came up with a tolerance uh, for the underwing, which is – 300 thousandths window which is a little bit under three eighths of an inch um so they have a zero and you can be 150 thousandths on either side of that zero um which is like an eighth of an inch basically so there's it's all adjustable and we can move uh there's four big panels underneath the car that you that you can move um up or down not really side to side so our aero department all they do now is basically try different um, configurations. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. On the underwing. Yeah. So we're up to like 130 options. And every time you change one single adjustment, it's an option, right? right? C- because if for your notebook, you have to have proper, correct notes. Because as soon as you have something that's not not exact, then it's then it's not real. Yeah. So we, we're up to like 130 options. And the whole, like I said, all, all those panels underneath the car are adjustable, and we have this small box that we can work in, which I think small because we used to have free will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I spend most of my week. Uh, the, the aero department will tell us what track we're going to. This is the best configuration, and then you have to set it. And we have roamer arms and scanners and all kinds of stuff to check it. So so this year, and, uh, you know, I'm not the guy. I, I don't follow it that, that closely, but there was a, p- uh, a part shortage and you guys were at a certain point were allowed to fix those parts that were supposed to not be touched and then the rule went back now you're not allowed to touch them again how did that all shake out this year yeah so the so, so there's only a handful of parts that teams can actually still make and then there's uh, manufacturers that that control like they'll build five star does all of our body panels um, there's another company that does our underwings um, et cetera it goes on uh, but the they they the manufacturers couldn't keep up with the the parts that the teams needed to build multiple cars mm-hmm. at the time um, NASCAR was gonna give each team seven cars per car number um, so like the 24 car would get seven cars so right away even though we only have one chassis we're gonna order parts for seven cars yeah. right every team's gonna do that the manufacturers didn't realize that that was gonna happen they thought they were gonna build a set of panels for each team. And then once they get the next car, they build another set of panels. So it kind of blindsided them when all the teams needed all these parts um, pretty quick. Uh, and then we ended up getting chassis, so we started building cars faster. And obviously the manufacturers were at a deficit. They still couldn't keep up to the the, the parts that we needed. The other thing was um, you're not allowed to touch panels. You can't paint panels either. You can only wrap cars now so that NASCAR can pull the wrap off and make sure you didn't manipulate any any part of the car. Right. When you race, because it's 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 basically carbon fiber and Kevlar with a gel coat, if you touched anybody, it would crack the gel coat. So do you crack the gel coat in the shop to make a lip? Because I just raced this panel last week. It's an advantage. Well, then they're like, oh, you, well, you can't do that. Well, we don't have any body panels. Yeah. Like they can't keep up. So are we allowed to race this body panel or not? Well, you need to put a new one on. We don't have them. Um, Another thing was we were getting body panels and other parts of the car that had flaws in them. And we, we didn't want to race that panel, but if you sent it back, you would go to that, that part would go back to get fixed, but you'd be at the bottom of the list of all the people waiting on panels. So then you're out of panel for how many months you don't know. So NASCAR realized they had a big problem. Um, so what they did is they said, you can, we're going to allow you to fix the body panels just to help your inventory for seven races. Yeah. But we want documents, so you, we need before and after pictures. We want to see what it looks like before the damage or when it, when it was damaged, and then after you repaired it, how it looks, and then after the race, when we pull your wrap off, it better match the picture. Mm. So that's the way they were going to do it. Um, seven races, and it turned into over half the season, you know. And then the manufacturer started getting the inventory and dispersed it. Of course, the way the chassis and parts go, they can't 
they can't let a part go until they have like 36 or 38 of that part chassis body panel it doesn't matter because it's only fair if each team gets it at the same time sure. otherwise people are going to complain that some big team is going to get parts that they're not being able to get and so uh so they would they would hang on to those parts till they had enough and then they'd let it go so that was another another problem we fought um what happened was when they were when they were letting us fix our own panels some teams took it to another level and uh you can make something like a smoke and mirror. You can make it look like it was in the picture, but it's really not what it's supposed to be. And some teams got in trouble. They got caught and got fined. Right. Um, our philosophy now is like the the fine is so massive that NASCAR made it where it's it the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Like it's not worth getting in that much trouble and losing that many points and money over what, what you're going to gain, especially when all the downforce is under the car now. So it really tied our hands. So we don't really we don't mess with the body. We don't even push the envelope on the body because all of it's under the car. So we just try to maximize everything under the car now. Right. Huh. So do you think the new car has done what you know its job, what NASCAR wanted out of it? It gave them total control. Yeah. Yes. It, they got what they wanted. They a lot of the cheating is gone. You know, you you hear in the media that some people got caught, and that's just a fraction of what we used to do. Like, so many times we would, they would, NASCAR usually takes a car post race and they'll take it back to their facility and take it apart and look at it. I can't even tell you how many times that we were told, don't bring it back. They should have got fined. Like, the only way you're gonna, you're gonna stop people from doing it is to make an impact on them. And, they, and so many times they'd be like, okay, I, we know what you're doing. Don't do it again. You know, and we go back to shop. Okay, we're doing it to every car. Well, it's a free-for-all then. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was just out of control. So they have control now. So that part of it they got. The, they didn't really see the parts thing coming. That hurt That hurt it a lot. Um, the chassis is way too stiff. Obviously, you know, we got some drivers hurt, which we don't want. That was, you know, a horrible thing to see. So – they, they went back to work and they, they made the car where it's going to absorb some energy next year. But I think on the flip side, it might be, we, we don't know this yet because we haven't raced, but it might be like a double-edged sword. Now I think we're going to start damaging more parts yeah. underneath the body because the, the clips are going to move more, which is going to you know get into more parts. So we're going to see. I'm not sure how it's all going to pan out yet. We won't know until we start racing, but it's like when, you know, if you got a you got a leak in a hole, you put a bandaid on it, and another hole pops up. Yeah. So we're trying to chase all these all these holes. But right, right. Do you uh, you're still a young guy, but do you ever do you have a retirement plan ever? Are you gonna Are you one of those guys who's gonna work till they die? <laughs> I would. I I wish I could think that I could retire, but I don't know if I ever could. Yeah. I'm on the go all the time, and I have a shop at my house. Uh, so. My my oldest son Cole, since since he can't race on weekends on asphalt stuff that we were racing, um, because he's out of town, he decided to buy a dirt car that he can race on Wednesday nights close to our house. Okay. So we have that in our shop. Uh, he just he sold his he sold one and built a new one, and then I got a 1970 C10 I'm building for my uh, younger son. But uh, I I don't I'm not really good at finishing projects. Like I'll I'll. St- I'll, I'll be two thirds way done. I'll have an idea yeah. and I'll go over here and I'll start building something else. Or some guy will call me. He needs a late model body put on. I'll be like, yeah, bring it over. I'll put a body on, you know? So I don't, I don't never stop. Like I don't sit, I'm not a very good sitter. I don't stand around. I don't like, you know, not doing anything or having, I, it's going to be hard for me to retire. Yeah. Finishing projects is anticlimactic. You know, it's, it's the, it's the new idea. That's the exciting part, right? The new project is the exciting part. Yeah. I just, my brain never stops. Like I just, I gotta, I gotta hone in on, on what I'm working on and, and, and then have an idea. But my problem is I, I have ideas all the time and it's like, man, I want to pursue something. So I, I start another project, but I'll, I'll go back and finish them. I don't really have anything that I, other than that truck, I haven't finished, but, uh, yeah, I just, I already got ideas for my next project. <laughs> um, what kind of advice, cause there's, there's so many guys up here who, who are so far removed from, you know, Mooresville and, and Charlotte and want to make that jump, but you know, it seems like you may as well be sailing a- across the ocean. What advice do you have for guys all over the world who who want to make that jump and, and live the life that you're living? 
yeah so uh like, like i said i i was a small a, ki- a kid from a small town right I had a dream that i didn't think i could ever make happen and dreams are achievable always people achieve dreams every day um if if you want something bad enough you'll you have to go get it the racing in general um if if you want to get into you know a a high level uh series or or team you got to start at the bottom um i don't i don't believe in just landing on a on a big team and you hit you hit your hit the ground running those people don't last normally um i like to learn the hard way you learn i if i'm going to if i'm going to have a race car i want to know every single nut and bolt in that thing i want to know what makes it tick um, so I, I like, I would say go to your short track, small, small team, little family, start helping those guys and learn, you know, what makes those things work and then, uh, move up. Right. Um, the other thing is like talk less, listen more because there's, there's so much advice out there. And as soon as, as soon as I hear somebody's ego, I'm already done with you. I'm not going to give you advice, right? Because you already know everything. Yeah. Uh, I like I like to learn a lot, but it, uh, most of your peers have already been there and done that, and they'll and they'll teach you a lot. Uh, all you have to do is listen, and a lot of times people get ahead of it and 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 miss out on a lot of good opportunities. So, and just because there's a border between Canada and the United States, um, it's probably the hardest thing to get across mm. the right way, right? Like legally. But it's the hardest thing. So, it, if you can over, if you can find your way through there, I mean, the, there's, it's it's right there. You yeah. can you can have it. Just uh, it's tough. But yeah, anybody can do it. If I did it, I promise you, anybody can do it. Good. Yeah. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, man. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah, this was it was good. Yeah. We'll do it again. Uh, we'll do it again when we can talk about uh, maybe ten years from now. We can talk about uh, the new car. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or I can open my book and tell you all the cheating stuff we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whenever that statute of limitations runs out, yeah. come on back. <laughs> Thanks. If you guys enjoyed this, give me a rating and share it with some friends.